start any talk about customer acquisition with a little bit about my philosophy on brand, if you will. And if you distill a brand down to its essence, in my opinion, you really, you want to own a word. Now, a word might be a little bit ambitious for a startup, but for the car companies, you know, a word like performance for BMW or quality for Toyota, safety definitely for Volvo, you know they own that, or Zoom for Mazda. Uh, think for a minute about what the ceiling on Mazda's market share is with Zoom versus what the ceiling for performance is or the ceiling for safety, right? And so you need to understand that the words that you choose and the message that you're going to distill to and own have the potential to limit the size of your company ultimately. So think about that as you're going in and grabbing your market. Technology adoption curve, we've all seen this, I think. <laughs> the beauty of the technology adoption curve is that if you can get up to that scale point, you get a Sisyphus effect from marketing anyway. Here at the beginning of the ramp, you've got to push the rock really hard up the hill, and it's a lot of work to get your name out there, to get those early adopters to love you. And that's how you're marketing in the beginning. It's all about a friendship relationship. Uh, it's all about being cool. It's all about being part of the, the hip crowd to get those early adopters and opinion makers to, to take you on and start with you. Once you get to the big ramp part, you're, you're going for the herd mentality there. Everyone's doing it. Join in. The herd is safe built into our psyches. Uh, and then uh, to get the laggards at the very end, the laggards almost always hold out because they're afraid. So they're afraid of privacy, they're afraid of theft, they're afraid of something. And so to get the laggards at the end, you're switching to a really more of a trusted mode and more of a safe mode of marketing. So your messaging is going to change as your life evolves. Uh, and that's appropriate. The other thing that I want to mention about it though, when you're trying to get the herd mentality going, you're trying to get a stampede started, right? And so the time to get your systems scalable is when you're in that early ramp. Because if the stampede starts and now you're trying to rebuild your infrastructure, you're in for a wild ride. <laughs> Back to the herd mentality, because this is how we think. Uh, markets like to naturally evolve to a 60% leader that's the popular best solution, so to speak, a 30% alternative that, that people can go to, and then this sort of true renegade. Uh, over long periods of time, the population's comfortable with this. They don't want any one company owning their market, because then that company's in a monopoly, monopoly position, they can do bad things. And so very graciously, a consumer audience will split off into these segments naturally. And so almost every industry likes to evolve eventually into this sort of 60, 30, 8% split. I showed McDonald's, McDonald's Burger King, Wendy's, but let's go through a couple others. How about Google, Yahoo, Bing for search, or Microsoft, right? I, I want to use that example in particular to illustrate another thing. Once you get your position, it's very hard to move you out. Defending your position is much more cost effective than establishing the position. So think about how much money Microsoft spent to knock my Yahoo out of number two. And I would actually argue that if Yahoo was not in a state of disarray at the time, they could have defended that position very inexpensively. Uh, they just weren't in a place where they could do that company-wise. But that said, they still spent a fortune and they didn't get near Google. If you looked at Google's market share through that whole fight, it really didn't move. Uh, so you want to lock up your first spot in the market. You, you, this is why you need to move fast. You need to move into the consolidated market and consolidate it yourself. A few other examples, I guess. Coke, Pepsi, RC, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Walmart, Target, Kmart. The car market was pretty consolidated until we started shipping cars in from other countries. It was GM, uh, Ford, Chrysler, right? Cars are now being shipped in from other countries and a, a reconsolidation is going on. And there are going to be some companies that don't exist anymore as a result of that because the market wants to evolve back into that three. The only thing better than being the 60% on the front of the market is if you can be 60% and maybe be a rev share partner of the 30%. <laughs> or if you can have two brands, one is the 60%, the other is the 30%. It was the ultimate goal of many credit card companies and why you see financial institutions breaking off into different brands. They want to be that first credit card in your wallet and they want to be the second credit card in your wallet because they know that they can consolidate that way. If you find yourself in a position where you couldn't get that 60% position, uh, a, a very good strategy that's often pursued is to fragment that market. Uh, Coke very intelligently saw that the soda market was getting ready to fragment and they decided they were going to win the fragmented piece. Thus Diet Coke is also a popular leader. 
Pepsi then, maybe out of frustration, decided they were going to split the soda market into old soda and young soda. And they hired Michael Jackson. They did Pepsi, the choice of a new generation, right? And they, they, they tried to split it. Uh, it wasn't a split that resonated with consumers in the end, and it didn't work, but it, you know, I applaud the effort. Uh, Honda found, found themselves lock, locked out of the SUV market in, in my last example. And so they created a vehicle, which think about how many people drive SUVs through off-road, right? It's, it's not really. A minivan is almost functionally identical, but it was a new market. They could break it off. They could call it the family SUV. And then companies like Honda and Chrysler, the early minivan leaders, could own that market because it's too hard to fight in the SUV market when it was already won. So it leads me to uh, inbound marketing. First, the two, two main ways that uh, startups tend to, to begin scaling. One, I'll, I'll bucket into inbound marketing. This is, this, it's a HubSpot term. It's sort of the free marketing, if you will. <laughs> uh, and the other one is direct marketing. And, and if a startup is selling things like advertising, they're often going to be going for the free marketing, so to speak. But if they're selling a hard good uh, where somebody's pulling a credit card out and buying it, direct marketing might make sense to do at the same time. I'll get to direct marketing, don't worry. But I want to start with inbound marketing because almost every startup needs to do it anyway. Blogs are the bricks. They're the building blocks. They're the way you get your name out there, the way you get known as an opinion leader or a thought leader in a space, the way you get uh, content to drive your PR campaigns, the way you get content to react to and for people to distribute on social, and the way that you get unique content for the search engines to point at and index. So blogs I see as a building block and a, and a fundamental thing, but I guess the idea of the blog is having unique content on your site uh, that's substantive. PR is an interesting one. When you're a startup, it's tough, right? You can, you can uh, email uh, authors yourself, and, and you can try that road. Uh, when you don't have a big name, you can lean on friends around you. Rock Health has done a great job making a good name for themselves, and so you might be able to lean on their name a little bit to help you get doors open. Similarly, if at some point you're working with a VC, almost every VC has their own PR arm. If you're working with angels, if you have an advisory board, almost all those people, if they're around in industry, have access to a PR function somewhere. Uh, and so lean on them. Take, take advantage of them. Ride their coattails if you can. They might even be able to ride yours once in a while, too. Uh, it can be a very symbiotic relationship. But it's a great way to get started there. Um, social, I think you all know about more than any other generation. <laughs> But the goal of social is to get to, to viral, really, at the end of the day. Um, and, and I'll finish there. I put Walt's picture up there on the PR front because if you can get Walt to review your app, uh, you should. He's, he's going to carry as much weight as the rest of the industry together. One hint about working with Walt, and it's true about working with most PR folks, he likes exclusives. If you've already gone out to other people and you're already selling your app everywhere, you're much less likely to get him to do that big breakout review for you. So it might be worth your time to hold out for a few key superstars on PR first before you go out more broadly with your stories. That was the point on Walt's picture. SEO, I wanted to give you a little bit more hands-on view of things. There are a few pieces to SEO. Keyword research is one of the most important uh, going after the right pieces. So I wanted to show you that and then some of the reporting. And then I'll just give you some references to other resources. My keyword research example, I don't know if, I hope you can read it. <laughs> I did a search for acne treatment. Uh, this is in uh, Google AdWords keyword tool. It's a free tool, it's kind of an industry standard. If, if you look down the list, well, first of all, acne treatment, if I wanted to go after that keyword, the competition for it is extremely high. There's half a million searches a month for it. Doesn't sound bad, right? But extremely high competition. So as I look down the list, the word acne has medium competition with 9 million searchers. A lot bigger, less competition. Looks a little attractive, sure. But I get down to IPL. IPL is a type of acne treatment. Has low competition, still 6 million searches. Intriguing to me, right? A little more research, I found out it's the India Premier League. I think it's a cricket league. <laughs> Maybe that's not the one for me. But the very next one, Pimples, also has very few people uh, going after it, and it gets 4 million searches a month. And then as I go further down in this list, how to get rid of acne has low competition and almost 700,000 searches a month, more than acne treatment. 
So even though acne treatment might be my distilled brand identity, it might not be the SEO keywords I go after first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so pick the fights that you can win when you're starting in SEO. It will build credibility with the search engines. It will help you on quality score. It will help you win the bigger fights later as you get larger. But start with the fights you can win. This is the uh, Google Webmaster Tools. If, if you have a website, um, sign up for it, look at it. It, it will report to you how many impressions there are for keywords that sent traffic to your site, where your rank was for those keywords, uh, what the click-through rate looks like. At the end of the day, I have a little table in here that says if you're position number one, you'll get 25% click-through rate, position number two, 12%, and it keeps going down until positions nine and 10. For whatever reason, the end of the line has a little bit of a lift up, but you can't aim for those, so don't worry about them. <laughs> um, so the goal, obviously, is to get your rank as high as possible. One way to do it is to cause your click-through rate to be higher than what it should be for your rank. If Google sees you're in position number seven and you're getting a 5% click-through rate, you're not going to be in position seven long. You're going to move up. So optimize what's being showed there and, and try to get your click-through rate and the quality score as high as you can. A lot of the rest of SEO is around spider digestibility. So you know, Google's got an automated tool. It, it's about making your site sort of machine readable for it and making your site in such a way that it's hard to spam or spoof the spider. Spider doesn't like being spammed or spoofed. Uh, it, it'll kill your rankings if, if it thinks you're trying to trick it. So it, it looks for things like H1 headers that are high contrast to their background and large at the top of a screen. And there are a number of other rules that it looks for, and it points you to white hat experts in the field that have been doing this for a long time, Jill Whalen and Danny Sullivan, solid resources. That book, uh, Visual Blueprint to Search Engine Optimization. It's a very hands-on book. It's a quick read. Every page of it is a new exercise that's specific. You can use it for your company and go through the exercises. You'll learn an awful lot about SEO. Ultimately, all of the inbound marketing is going for viral coefficient. And I, I put the equation up first, not because there's anything magic about the equation, but it does tend to break down the world into the, the analytics pieces you want to look at. Uh, the viral coefficient is just the number of invites per customer that you have times the conversion of those invites to a new customer. Uh, if you break it down in, into the loop, you start out with a customer that's using your product. They invite some or many people to use your product because they liked it, presumably, or because you incented them to. <laughs> These other people check out your product. Some of them will come to use it as well and like it, and, and the viral loop starts over again. The goal is to get the viral coefficient greater than one. The idea then is I can go acquire one customer, and I'll get ex exponential growth from the one customer as the viral coefficient takes off. So in order to do that, I'm focusing on those pieces that I just broke it down to. How many invites can I get you to send out? How easy can I make it for you to invite? How, may, how easy can I make it for you to invite 20 people instead of two? Um, can I incent you to invite? Can I incent you with something that has a high perceived value, although maybe it's not costing me much? Maybe badges come to mind, right? <laughs> um, maybe a special uh, access to something that's of interest to your audience comes to mind, but so something potentially that's high perceived value but isn't going to cost you much. The second piece, the conversion piece, at the sort of furthest out there uh, uh, on the funnel is the banner. I also wanted to give you some rules of thumb. Like, uh, people consider 0.1% click-through rate on a banner sort of nominal. If, uh, you can get higher than that if you have a very well-qualified audience. You'll get lower than that if you have a poorly qualified audience or a poorly optimized banner content. But start out with 0.1% as sort of a thinking range there. Then next question people always ask me, what's, what should the bounce rate be on my landing page? They, they have their Google Analytics account to monitor their site, and uh, they see a 50% bounce, bounce rate, and they go, oh my gosh, half the people coming here leave. 50% is actually pretty close to the norm, <laughs> and it's not that unusual. There is a wide range, again, depending on the audience qualification and kind of what you have going on, but 50% isn't anything scary there. But that's another thing to optimize. Uh, how are you bringing people to the site? Should your landing pages look different for different audiences, depending on what they were coming in on? Likely the answer is yes. Uh, form and purchase. So particularly for people with checkouts, uh, this is the next place you know, to optimize. How do you get people from going into a shopping basket to pulling out their credit card and ordering your product? So a lot of people stop right there, by the way. And that's what they optimize for their customer acquisition funnel. How can we get people to purchase? One shot through right to there. I actually advocate that's not nearly far enough. 
Um, that's okay from a conservative marketing spend point of view. If you can make that revenue positive, great. Like you, you can make it work. But you can likely grow a lot faster if you consider the full value of your funnel. So I continue the funnel along to lifetime value next, or repeat usage. And what can we do to optimize that? That might mean something like getting people to sign up for your weekly newsletter. That might mean things like getting people to turn uh, on-screen alerting on, on a mobile phone app because there's some value for it that they perceive that's beyond getting them to go back into the app, which is maybe what you really want them to do. Uh, will they be a promoter? So will they bring other people in? If so, there's some value in that, particularly if you don't have to pay them or if you're paying them less than you're paying elsewhere. At the end of the day, I always argue to everybody that you should be optimizing strategic value of the customers that you're bringing in. For most startups, you know, I, I would argue that getting market share, getting to that consolidated number one spot of your target market that you're aiming for has the greatest strategic value. There are exceptions to that. Uh, some people have truly unique products, particularly IP protected products, where it might not be as important to get to that leader spot because nobody can compete anyway. But often, uh, it's going to be getting to that consolidated position. And so there's going to be a lot that's about acquisition volume. There's likely going to be a cost constraint. You're going to be burning cash. You're going to need to get new investments. Uh, so uh, you know, there's a lot to balance and juggle, and I appreciate that. But at the end of the day, keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on market share. This one I just wanted to mention a few of the favorite resources and the simple resources that are out there. Uh, Visual Website Optimizer uh, and Optimizely, I'd say, are two of the most popular that I point people toward. Optimizely is a Y Combinator company. I think Optimizely is a little bit better if you're going to have complex scenarios, multiple scenarios running to keep track of. I think Visual Website Optimizer is a little bit easier to get up and going on. That's today. Both of those products are improving quickly, so six months from now that answer could be different. But they're both pretty solid products. Uh, everybody in the Brothers working with Google Analytics. Um, the one challenge I would warn you about on Google Analytics is it's hard to measure lifetime value with it. It's doable and it's worth the effort, but it, it can be challenging. Uh, so I would encourage you to invest that effort. So first a little general talk about direct marketing, I guess. Uh, at the end of the day, direct marketing, you know, f for me it means you're going to pay to bring traffic for your site and you're going to try to make more money off of the traffic once they're on the site than you paid to bring them in. There's a spectrum of types of direct marketing. Some of them are, are lower risk for publishers. Some of them are lower risk for advertisers. If you think about it from a publisher's shoes, I have uh, 10 million people coming to my website every month. They're generating this many impressions. The safest thing for me to do is actually uh, sell a, a listing fee. So you pay me a fixed amount. Whether I get 10 million people there or 2 million people there, you're paying the same amount every month. And so you see a lot of people, particularly with really exclusive properties, that charge listing fees. The publisher has all the leverage in the deal there. Um, the, the next best thing for me as a publisher is to charge a CPM, cost per melee, cost per thousand impressions. Uh, that one, as long as I get my 10 million people there, I can, I can be assured that I get that revenue fr from this arrangement. Facebook works that way. LinkedIn works that way. I mention these because uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Google Content Network in particular are more democratized systems where you can go in as a small company and you can bid against the very large companies and you're on fairly equal footing in, in terms of how you're bidding. Uh, and not every network is that way. There are a lot of ad networks where you're going to have to come in with an agency. It's going to cost a lot of money to bring them in. Um, and so for startups, you know, I always start with these sort of scaled uh, and democratized networks. CPC is the next model. It's what Google chose for search and SEM, paid search listings. Uh, you, can, you can get people to do an email, although people also like CPM deals for email as well. But on CPC, you pay the person when they cause somebody to click on your banner. And so it puts the onus on them into bringing a qualified audience in. If you're paying CPM, they can run garbage audience into the site. You could get nothing from it. You could get very few clicks, and you still have to pay. On a CPC, they at least have to get people to click the banner and come to your site. Then it's on you to try to convert that audience once they get there, uh, also called pay-per-click. CPA, the lowest risk for advertisers, cost per action. So in this model, I don't pay until typically you've purchased on my site. So a, a very typical version would be I'll give you, the publisher, 5% of any revenue that you generate on my, on my site. That's Amazon's affiliate program deal. 
Amazon is one of the big CPA deals that's out there. But there are three large affiliate networks out there, Commission, Junction, Google Affiliate Network, and Linkshare, that are all worth looking around at and snooping around at. If for no other reason than for competitive intelligence, see what competitors in your space are paying for their CPA deals within those networks. Sign up as a publisher. <laughs> Invite a friend is also typically CPA. Groupon and other flash sale sites are also typically CPA. So, so these are all potential markets out there in direct space. The one that I want to go into more detail on is search engine marketing because it's almost always one of the easiest ones to start on. You can go on, you can buy $100 worth of traffic, you can try it out and see how it works pretty easily. It has a similar process to SEO. You start with what keywords are working and why. Uh, quality score still counts. Quality score is kind of like this. If you're Google and there's two of us bidding for a keyword, let's say I'm paying a dollar, my competitor is paying $100. But my, my competitor is selling something that nobody wants. So Google's wasting the impression when they put it up there. Nobody's going to click on it. And even if they do click on it, they go to the site and they go, wow, I really didn't want to be here. This is not a value to me. I'm going to go back to Google and I'm going to train myself not to click on those Google ads. In the long run, that's not going to be a good, a good deal for Google. And so they measure things, both the click-through rate, but they also measure things like, how long do you stay on the site? Do you come back to the search results again and click something else subsequently? Uh, and they're inferring things based on the behavior of people they send over and back. What's the answer? Bid on keywords that are related to your product or service. Um, provide content and landing page that's optimized and, and you know, of interest to your audience. And then Google will see that when they send traffic your way, they like it. If your quality score is higher, you can bid lower than other people and still be above them in the SEM market space. So quality score is a key there. Ad groups are, are used for tracking, and I'm not going to go into detail for them right now. The search engine result page content optimization, it's the same as I was talking about on SEO, where you can, you can modify the text that shows up there. I, again, you're trying to strike a balance between getting people to click and not deceiving people so that you're hurting your quality score, because ultimately that will hurt you in the long run. Uh, and there's lots of SEM analytics. Actually, the tools that Google provides are, are not terrible, uh, especially at startup level. I listed a couple books uh, as well as blogs for your benefit. I'll just leave them there as resources if you want to look for them later. But all right, what do you do with all this traffic coming in? You just bought a whole bunch of traffic. Uh, typically, when we're looking at how the traffic performs and behaves, we like to slice and dice the world up into segments. Uh, Typically, you'll segment on, on one axis by the channel or the campaign that you were running, and on the other axis by some, some other attribute of your audience. In this case, I use message. And, and so for my channels, I said display advertising or banner ads. Uh, branded SEM, so this is, these are people that were searching for my company's name. They already heard it somewhere and they're looking for me. And then category SEM, and that's somebody who's searching for an attribute of my company like acne treatment. <laughs> My two messages that I use in my example here, one was a value message. It says, I'm the lowest cost provider of acne treatment. Uh, the other is a unique message. I have the best one out there by far. There's nothing else like it, and you can't get it anywhere else. Um, and so you can run in all these different channels. You can then segment the audience that comes in. You could do it by message like I've done. You could do it by whatever you want. You could do it by gender. You can do it by geography. You can do it by the types of keywords that they came in on. Um, so how many people uh, came through on it? How did they convert? What's the first purchase amount? What's the lifetime value? In my hypothetical example, but it's, it can happen pretty easily, actually, uh, the value message has got higher conversion, but a lower purchase amount and a lower lifetime value because people aren't coming back. They'll, they're just they're not loyal. They're not brand loyal. Whereas in my unique messaging, uh, I have a lower conversion, but those people are worth more in the long run. Now, some people would say, pick one, pick the other, do both. I would say, can you create a new messaging, a third competitor to this, where you can get all of the benefits of the unique messaging in terms of the loyalty and the purchase amount, but still get the high conversion of the first message? And so I would use these as benchmarks and start to build more segments and more messaging and use these to inform my testing going forward. The goal is to get everything to lift. If, if every segment didn't lift, don't despair, uh, learn, and, and then move forward from there. So for me, at the end of the day, uh, when you're doing this, don't worry, I won't go through the equations. <laughs> it's just for reference. <laughs> but at the end of the day, everything's a champion challenger. Uh, 
and I think of I think of my customer acquisition methods like a stock portfolio. I have my core investments that I'm probably making and running every month and doing. Uh, and then I have challengers coming in all the time where I'm trying to beat them. My challengers are going to be quick and dirty. I'm not necessarily going to have a perfect challenger right off. And because of that, if the challenger doesn't actually beat the champion, but if they're in the same sort of ballpark <laughs> on the quick and dirty version, I might be willing to go try it some more, try to polish it up and see if I can beat the champion. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to be trying to improve the champions uh, simultaneous and, and see if I can keep raising the bar there. At the end of the day, it's a continuous imp uh, improvement game. And you've got a portfolio to work with every month. You should be making new bets all the time. You should set up systems where you can learn quickly and you can fail quickly. <laughs> you also need to set up systems where you can understand when you've hit that point where you've learned and failed. So one thing that happens a lot, particularly on lower volume sites in the beginning, you'll run an A and a B test. You'll say, oh, this one's hi higher after a day. You go with that one and you move on. Well, you actually needed to use some uh, hypothesis testing statistical equations to say, is it really statistically better or not? And you need to run your test and you need to run these challengers until you have statistical validity of the difference. Otherwise, you're going to be following noise. Uh, and you're going to have a hard time getting the right result. So you run the test. You know, how big does the test need to be? How long does it need to run? Uh, long enough to get convergence on your statistical validity. When I'm setting up direct deals, I'm trying to set them up so that at the beginning of each day, I can look at the previous day's data and look at everything that I've run and say, has it converged yet? If it has, do I have contract terms that will let me shut things off one day at a time, day by day by day? What's my minimum daily commitment? How much am I putting at risk each day? But how fast can I get to a converged result and learn and improve? And at the end of the day, you know, that's the solid scaled customer acquisition model that I play, and I was uh, very happy to share it with you here today, and I hope that it benefited you.